but at the same time, I feel kind of made up myself. I, you know, for 12 years working on Kimmel, I was on Hollywood Boulevard. So leaving work every day, I'd walk among the superheroes, you know, the fake <laughs> Elmos and, right. and Batmans and all right. that. And uh-huh. I kind of felt at home among all the, the, the made up superheroes because here I am with this ridiculous IQ and I'm writing jokes and, you know, it, it's, it had a certain kind of weird made upness to it. The Hallie Casser Jane Show Talk Radio for Fine Minds airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, and is always available for your listening pleasure at HallieCasserJane.com. Thank you so much for joining me. I am Hallie Casser Jane. Today on the Hallie Casser Jane Show, the man with the world's second highest IQ and the highest IQ in America. Joining me at my table, is Brainiac and award-winning television writer, Rick Rossner. But before we begin, a brief message from our sponsors. You are listening to The Hallie Casser Jane Show. The Hallie Casser Jane Show is always available online at HallieCasserJane.com and a host of venues, including Blog Talk Radio. Be sure to visit us at our newest home on iHeartRadio. Today, The Hallie Casser Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With over 150,000 titles in virtually every genre, you'll find what you're looking for. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today by signing up at www.audibletrial.com forward slash the Hallie Casser Jane Show. Is someone you love living with frequent pain? Are they spending more time just sitting in a chair or lying in bed or going to the ER more often? Other than taking them to the doctor, you may not know what else to do. Treasure Coast Hospice can help in more ways than you may realize. Even if you don't think your loved one is ready for hospice care, their experts can evaluate your loved one's condition and direct you to the right resources in our community. Call Treasure Coast Hospice to learn more or visit tchospice.org. Hello, I'm Hallie Kesser-Jane, host of the Hallie Kesser-Jane Show. Join me Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern when I talk with the great artists, writers, musicians, politicians, and celebrities of our day. The Hallie Kesser-Jane Show is talk radio for fine minds. Tune in live. Or listen to the podcast at HallieCasserJane.com. Rick Rosner has the second highest IQ in the world. In 2012, the Huffington Post ranked Rosner, along with Brainiac, theoretical physicist Stephen Hawking, as one of the ten smartest people on the planet. According to the Giga Society, He has 198 IQ, which makes it all the more remarkable that after graduating high school, Rossner forged documents, fabricated records, created disguises, and lied to officials so he could return to high school over and over again. From his teens through most of his 20s, Rossner spent time in five different high schools from Hollywood to Harlem. All of that education and work as a stripper, a bouncer, a roller skating waiter, and a nude model somehow prepared him for his adult career as a TV writer. Rick's credits include shows such as Remote Control, Crank Yankers, The Man Show, The Emmy Awards, The Grammy Awards, and Jimmy Kimmel Live. All in all, Rosner has contributed more than 2,500 hours of broadcast television, earning himself seven Writers Guild Awards and Emmy nominations. Let's talk. So I got to ask you, Rick, is intellect overrated? Some of the smartest people I know do some of the dumbest damn things. What do you think? I don't know. We're all kind of the same thing. I, I have a saying that even the world's smartest rabbit is, is still a rabbit. Pro, I think we're the products of evolution. And evolution, you know, it, it, it means that we've got kind of a raggedy mental structure. Our history of, with evolution means that what we need to do is, is live long enough to reproduce and then raise kids 
And that leaves a lot of stuff that we'd like to be really good at out, you know, because our brains are kind of stitched together. Our consciousness is kind of half-assed and threadbare, though our brains tell us that we're awesome. But when you look at how people actually are, we, we fall short of awesome quite often. So let me ask you a question. If you had the choice between being smart or dumb, which would you choose? Which is easier? I've been both, and, and you know, smart is better, but dumb can be fun. <laughs> There's that fun thing, huh? Um, we're going to talk about fun in a minute. So let's go back to the beginning a little bit with you. Uh, for, what's the basis for your claim to have the world's second highest, second highest IQ, which we're going to talk about that too in a minute? Well, I, I think I'm a little higher than that. But you do, I've huh? taken <laughs> oh, more than 30 IQ tests of the really ridiculously crazy tough kind, and on about 20 of them, I've gotten the highest score that anybody's ever gotten on that test. Okay. I'm, I'm kind of like the Tiger Woods before his wife hit him in the head with a golf club <laughs> oh, no. of IQ tests. So question, what got you to be taking these IQ tests? A couple things. One is I was desperate to have something going for me. <laughs> and two, I was a, a nude art model for, I don't know, 20 years off and on. And poses are painful. If you pick the wrong pose, you're in trouble because you have to hold that pose for 25 minutes. Uh -huh. And I needed something to think about to distract me while I was, you know, holding the pose. I found that the problems on these super hard IQ tests were a good thing to think about. Okay. All right. You test well. I've had a lot of practice, but yeah. Because not everybody does. And they can be intelligent, but they just don't test well. Yeah, I mean, but I, I, I started early. My elementary school was across the street from the University of Colorado, mm -hmm. and they took the kids who liked mental tasks. They pulled them out of class when some grad student in psych wanted to try out a, a test he or she'd come up with. Where they put us in an office and try out the test. So I, I, I ended up taking a lot, a lot of tests. Okay. So talk to me about this. Tell me about your parents. Smart? Yeah, smart, but a different time. I was born in 1960, mm -hmm. and there, there there wasn't helicopter parenting, and there, there wasn't, you know, AP tests were not a thing, and they're, you know, a academic, and everybody just kind of assumed that if you sent your kid to the local public school, everything would be fine. Was it? And yes and no. I had my first IQ test in kindergarten. The teacher called my mom and my stepdad in and said, your child's a genius and my mom kind of freaked out because she didn't know how to deal with that she'd already been having problems with it in that I taught myself to read at like age three and three quarters and the neighborhood other moms thought since she was an ex-teacher was somehow like keeping me in indoors all day and, and tutoring me to make me into this prodigy and she was doing no such thing I stayed inside all day because I was bad with other kids and because I was a spaz and I like staying inside and reading. And she just thought if she treated me as a normal kid, that maybe I'd turn out to be a normal kid. Ah, so your parents wanted you to be normal, and intel intelligence isn't normal. Well, so, they, and they just didn't want me to... They didn't know how to deal with anything, you know, beyond that. It wasn't the era for that. You know, if I were a kid now, I'd be enriched out the butt. You know, everybody would be overjoyed that, you know, they could send me to college at 11. But back then, that was not right. the deal. Okay. In terms of you and how you think on all of this, do you think this is inherited? Or do you think that there's some being out there who goes, voila, Rick Rosner is going to be a smart guy. Where, where does this there, come from? I mean, it, it's it's an inextricable, it's an untangleable tangle where I had some natural abilities and then I think there's a little bit of, you know, sand in an oyster, the, the right level of stress and agitation. My, my friend Adam Carolla grew up in horrible, lazy parenting, lazy schooling conditions in the San Fernando Valley in the 70s. And somehow the combination of terrible conditions ignited a certain kind of genius in him with that same kind of, you know, sand and an oyster kind of deal. It's, it's a lucky combination of stuff. I inherited some stuff. My mom has excellent language skills. My dad's a CPA. I must have gotten, you know, my dad has pretty healthy case of OCD. So, you know, you throw that together and you've got some good ingredients. My grandpa, you know, possibly invented Alka-Seltzer. He, he was a pharmacist what? who invented a lot of this stuff. Really? Um, yeah. He, he got it stolen from him by, you know, Miles Laboratories. Well, that's not very smart. <laughs> 
<laughs> well, yeah, but, you know. I'm kidding. I get it. I get it. I totally get it. Do you have siblings? Yeah, I have a bunch of halves and a, a, and, a, and some steps. Nobody has the same two parents. So so how did it, how did it work for them? They bright, too? It, yeah, everybody's pretty smart. I've, I've got a brother who's a lieutenant colonel in the Marine Reserves. I've got another brother who's on Wall Street as a risk analyst, does a lot of other stuff that I don't understand. I've got an ex-stepsister who's a forensic psychiatrist. Wow. Um, an- another sister who's a lawyer. So, yeah, everybody came out more or less okay. A lot of marriages. It was the 70s. I mean, <laughs> Yeah, my, my dad <laughs> that was married three times, my mom twice, my stepmom three times. Yeah, so, yeah. Can I tell you, I'm doing something that I don't normally do, and that is I'm looking at you as we speak because I'm an audio girl, and, you know, I do an audio show, but we're doing this via Skype, and I kept the picture up. Must tell you this, and I mean this wholeheartedly, you have the kindest face I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Oh, well, thank you. I mean, I, I, wow. I think what you might be seeing is... My contacts are a little blurry, so... (laughs) I don't go down that road. And I made you smile. I only wanted to do that, try to do that once well, <laughs> during the show. I wish people could see. No, you have a very kind, sweet face, and your eyes are special. I, I just need to say that. I don't see that often. Well, thank you. I think I look like a friendly dog. Okay, I'll give you that. I'll give you that. A puppy, a cute little puppy. So Boulder, Colorado, good place to grow up? Yeah, great place to grow up. It didn't get really weird until <laughs> Mork and Mindy came on the air in 78. Right. <laughs> and now it's a little too fancy too, where yeah. the real estate's very expensive. So the people who move there are people who made a bunch of money somewhere else, which means that it's not young couples with kids, which means that, you know, they tried to close down my elementary school for not having enough students. They closed my junior high for no students. So, yeah, it's a little bit too frou-frou. Too frou-frou. Colorado, drug capital of the world, marijuana city. Did any of that play in, into your intellect as a kid growing up in the 70s? Not with my intellect. I've only been stoned once, and that was, I, I tried to get stoned a bunch, and I don't know, it just didn't work. The only time I've been stoned was I had half of a brownie a few years ago. <laughs> it and didn't work. <laughs> why didn't I, it, it, that, the brownie worked, and I didn't like it at all. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, you, th- you know why but, it didn't work? Is it because you're already out there? I don't know. I, I don't know, because I'm a real lightweight with booze, you know, like half a glass of wine, and I'm, I'm a little woozy. I don't know why pot doesn't work. Huh. But growing up, I mean, when I was in my late teens and early 20s, cocaine was all over Boulder. Oh, my God. Can I tell you? I'd love to see you. Extent, <laughs> I'd love to see you on coke. the bar I ever bounced <laughs> was, you know, under a drifts and drifts of coke. And I only did it a few times, and that was just so people didn't think I was a narc. Uh-huh. But working with a bunch of people who are doing a lot of coke is, is a pain in the ass because, you know, everybody's up till 5 in the morning telling the same story over and over. But, yeah, and... It'd be curious and, yeah, to see a, you on coke. It would be very curious to see your brain going fast. Well, I'm, I'm a little agitated anyway, so I don't need something that's <laughs> okay. speedy in me. I gotcha, I gotcha. So let's go back to that growing up there in Boulder and, and then high school. The smartest kid in the class thing, right? That's what you had. and, and usually, Pretty much. I right? mean, if I wasn't the smartest, then it would be me and some other kid. Paul Beck was up there, and yeah. So, so this smart thing when you're in high school, class nerd, is that fair to use that well, well, term? All right, so people who are younger than, I don't know how old you are, but I don't know, I assume we're contemporaries. Mm-hmm. People who are younger than us in their 20s and 30s have no idea how much of a stigma it was to be nerdy in, you know, the 60s and 70s and probably 50s before the the era of internet billionaires and geek chic and all that it was it was really bad bad news to be nerdy so, and i was i was about were. as nerdy as you could get so does that go into loner socially inept what 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 is that I, I, I wasn't antisocial, but I was socially inept. I wanted to be popular. I wanted to have a girlfriend. You know, I wanted to be cool. And I had lots of plans on how to do this, and they almost all backfired. All of them. I needed an older sibling to show me what to do. I didn't have that. Uh-huh. Were you always Rick? Did they call you Rick your whole life? I was Ricky as a little kid, and then hitting junior high, I thought I should be more grown up, and I went to Richard <laughs> for a couple of years, and that was no good. And then I went to Rick. Okay. And you're happy with Rick now. Rick works. Rick works. Rick yeah. works. Okay. It's, it's a little dated. My wife's name is Carol, and Rick and Carol are, <laughs> yeah. are you know, the Brady bunch. names of our generation. <laughs> really, right? So listen. Yeah, okay. you have a nice name that's not peggable to a particular generation. 
No, but but that's a problem, too. You can imagine growing up with the name Hallie. I've talked about this on air. I mean, you grow up with a name that's not like everybody else's name. And, you know, we have, like, ideas of who Rick is or who Susan is or who whatever is. And then here was this Hallie. And, you yeah. know, and I haven't led a normal life. And my mother, who, God bless her, is 93 years old, is like, why can't you be normal? Why can't you have 2.2 children? And I say, you named me Hallie. What did you expect? Right? Well, I, 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 I think that's nice. I think any I think something that sends you off on your own adventure. Right. Oh, no, I mean, I love it. Absolutely. But when I was a kid, no, not so much. I wanted to belong like you wanted to belong. You wanted a girlfriend. How'd that go in those years? Well, every nerd in his little nerd heart thinks that he's special in his in his sensitivity and perceptivity and and intelligence and kindness and whatever, because that's what the movies tell you, especially certain movies of the 70s and 80s where, you know, the good guy ends up getting the girl away from the douchey uh, quarterback. And so it took me a long time to figure out that I would really need to make some concessions to what actually worked if I ever wanted a girlfriend. And by then it was too late because Boulder was a small town. Everybody knew that when I, when I started lifting weights, when I started wearing a, a jean jacket with a popped collar and talking like Barbarino, everybody knew what I was up to, that I was a nerd trying to unnerdify myself. Let me interrupt Vinny Barbarino from Welcome Back, Cotter, in case anybody... Yeah, the Travolta me. character. Right, exactly. Cool, cool, cool. Hip slick, cool. Yeah, he was the epitome back in the late 70s with you know he had great hair he had a big old head and neck and you know <laughs> being smart through this whole high school thing trying to get laid probably that helped or hurt being smart it didn't help at all i started going out for sports and that went really badly i went out for wrestling and i got humongous hemorrhoids and had to be <laughs> operated on in the at the big i only lasted like two weeks trying to wrestle um, so it wasn't even like a, a, an injury that, you know, was cool. So I should have started, you know, with the weights and with the sports and all that maybe a little earlier, but it took me a long time to get a clue. So somewhere in all this research that I'm doing, and I can't remember where I heard it or saw it or read it, you were talking about kissing, and I was fascinated by this because it really in gave me... ninth grade, it was some kind of basement party with everybody, you know, on couches, and I was trying to cajole a girl into kissing me, and I, I thought if I, that she, I, I was looking for a pity kiss, because I wasn't, wasn't going to get a cool guy kiss, so I <laughs> was trying to explain how I didn't even know how to kiss, so I said, how do you kiss, suction or pressure, <laughs> hoping that she'd teach me, and she didn't teach me, and instead she told everybody in the school, so, you know, for the rest of the year, I had everybody coming up to me and saying, suction or pressure, <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> So that was, you know, one more little plan that just, you know, did the opposite of what I wanted. But there is this to say about it, which is smart people learn from their experiences, right? Versus Eventually. people who aren't as smart as people like you who don't learn readily from their experiences. So what did you learn from that experience? Oh, nothing specific except, <laughs> you know, try to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> while also, you're, while you're kissing, <laughs> the, the, the attention wasn't entirely bad. Like, you know, I eventually became a comedy writer for TV, and comedians develop a, a love hate relationship with attention, where they start off getting a lot of negative attention and getting really kind of angry and resentful, and then realizing they can use the attention and play with it and kind of really needing the attention after a while. So, you know, you have, you know, a lot of comedians have a semi antagonistic relationship with the audience audience. Okay, I get that. I get that. We'll explore that in a minute when we get into the comedy part of this conversation and you writing comedy. I wanted to go a little bit further. This high school thing, you repeated it a number of times over a period of, what, I don't know, how many years, how many schools? I mean, you The did... first time I graduated high school was in 1978 and the last time was in 1987. Okay. And what's the deal? I mean, tell All right, me the deal the was, tell senior me the year, I was head boy, which is like co-student body president, and I thought I was. this was going to be my my year to get a girlfriend. Mm -hmm. I was in all these clubs. I mean, I was transparently in all these clubs, hoping that somebody in the club would see what a you know what a really active, dynamic guy I was and want to be my girlfriend. There's a character in the movie Grease, really pretty obscure character named Patty Simcox, mm -hmm. who's like the most spirited girl in the school, and everybody hates her. She's just really annoying. I was the boy Patty Simcox. <laughs> So senior year wasn't working out, and I was applying to Harvard and then freaking out, 
thinking, if I can't get a girlfriend or lose my virginity in a little high school in a little town in Colorado, how am I going to compete with people who went to Exeter and people from the Kennedy family, you know, at, at Harvard? I'm going to be lonely there I'm, and I'm going to be able to flunk out just because, you know, I won't be able to handle the loneliness. So I decided to go back to high school, to not leave high school as a virgin. So I have two families because my parents got divorced and remarried, started family in, in two different towns. And so I broke into my high school, stole blank records so that I could be a senior again, move from Boulder to Albuquerque to where my other family lived, have a second senior year, and lose my virginity, which didn't even come close to happening. <laughs> Poor baby. I mean, I got into high school and I lasted a couple months, but uh, I barely talked to girls. My reinvention of myself as, as a semi-barbarino did not draw the women towards me. So you kind of became a perennial student trying every school from here to Kalamazoo for a well, while, which is great. Why not? You know, to get it right. Is that an obsessive compulsive part of your personality? I, I mean, the first time I went back was to get it right. Then a long time later, after a bunch of college, um, I was working on a theory of the universe and I was looking for a place to just sit and think for a number of months. So I thought before too much more of my hair fell out, I would go back to high school one last time and think about the structure of the universe and turn high school into my equivalent of Einstein's patent office. To do this, you had to um, manipulate a little bit in order to get into these schools with records and yeah, things like I'd, that. I'd, I'd fabricate fake, you know, school permanent records. The last time I went back to high school, I, I built 40 fake documents, an entire dossier, an entire, you know, kids permanent record, which the school district lost. So I had to get into school on the basis of four standby documents that I had. So Rick, you're, you're the second smartest man in the world, the smartest man in America. I think that's how that really plays. Do you, yeah, have you also I, I didn't know I was that at the time. Well, I understand. Have you also taken tests to find out if you have a criminal mind? <laughs> that part of the... I don't know. I'm, I'm probably, you know, a certain... I mean, I don't know. Maybe There's a, a guy named John Ronson has a thing called the psychopath test. Uh-huh. How'd you do? And I don't score that highly on it, but, you know, maybe, you know, 8 or 10% psychopathic. I don't know. Where, but I'm the kind of... I'm not a psychopath for the, you know, for the same reason that I don't go to Vegas and gamble because the math of it is 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 not good. How so is the math not good to be a, for the psychopath? You mean getting caught? What? Well, no, just psychopaths just leave a, a trail of, of, of destruction because they can and don't care morally or anything. And, you know, there's something to be said for not leaving a, a trail of destruction. Oh, it's very much it, so. It, it sucks for you and for kind of everybody else. And, and why do it? So, okay. So you don't think you're really a criminal then? You just do, you just did what you needed no, to do uh -uh. to get to where you needed I, to plus go? Plus, I'm terrible at lying. I got through, you know, a year of high school at age ages 26 and 27 just by like just not reacting at all uh -huh. when somebody was suspicious i just like kind of shrug it off like you know i'm just a dumb kid i don't know what you think you think but you know i'm just a dumb kid and i barely care what you think which is not really lying it's just not react and i can't lie to my wife because i'm just too transparent so it's that yeah, face i can't that... be a criminal because I, I i'd never be able to get away with much your face it's that face you couldn't do it just because of that face. That face shows everything. It's yeah, I don't, I've got large facial features, and I, they're hard to control. No, 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 no. I'm telling you, it's the, every ounce of vulnerability shows on that face of yours. I'm telling you, everybody's going to go to my website and see your face and understand what I'm talking about. Do you have an affinity for the underbelly of life? <laughs> have had some, oh my God, give me a break careers to get you, I guess, to get you through what you needed to get through to pay your way. Well, well, all right. So when I decided to go back to high school, uh -huh. under the Freedom of Information Act, I could at, I could request everything in my high school permanent record, which I did the me middle of my first real senior year. And I thought I was super duper smart enough to, you know, change the world of physics. I wanted to be, you know, an Einstein. And then I saw the contents of my permanent record, which included the results of a lot of IQ tests, and all my IQ scores were in the 140s, and you know, one maybe one at 151. And I decided, I realized that this wasn't smart enough. That I wasn't an IQ like that didn't make me smart enough to change the world. So that I would have to learn how to live in the world as a normal person. So, and I'd already, I'd already been lifting weights, and I just decided to get a bunch of meathead kind of jobs, like bar bouncer and stripper, and you know, live life as not a prodigy. Then after a couple of years of that, I did more research and found out that one of the reasons that I only scored in the 140s and 150s 
on these tests is that's where they stopped. The tests you're given <laughs> oh, no. in in school, they, they don't need m- more of a ceiling than that. The original purpose of, of IQ testing was to get kids the appropriate educational resources. And if a kid score, it doesn't matter for, you know, if you're going to give a kid, it doesn't matter whether a kid has an IQ of 170 or 150, you, that kid's going to need some, some extra stuff. The same way, it doesn't matter whether a kid has an IQ of 65 or 45, that kid on the other end is going to need extra attention. Once you figured that out, the Binet, who came up with the whole idea, wanted a five-point scale, you know, going from one to five, and then Terminant, Stanford, was the one who put it on this apparently more precise but not really, you know, scale that with a mean of 100. Hmm. Are you done? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I thought you were going to take it out a little bit further than that. Are you a savant? A little bit. I mean, you know, I, I, I'd like that word better than another word that I heard you toss around. Uh, uh, what was it? How did you describe yourself? Now my brain just died on that word. Well, I don't know. My Twitter ha- handle is dumbass genius, which <laughs> yeah, well, that is probably another it's... way of saying savant. Yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 the way you think, I think, is really extraordinary. Listen, one thing I have to ask you very quickly, a quick answer, because I'm, I'm going to watch that clock. And I want to make sure I get everything I want to ask you in. And that is okay. this. You had an unusual c- circumstance. You got to experience high school, five different high schools. So from your perch in the intellectual world and you look at that experience, what do you think of American schools in high school? Well, there's a thing called a meta-narrative that I just learned about, Mm -hmm. which is a big word for a simple concept of everybody working together for a shared goal, okay. for, for God, for country, for the Boy Scouts, for democracy. And a lot of those, for the church, a lot of those institutions kind of disintegrated in the 20th century. There's, you know, there's huge distrust of government now, a lot of distrust of, of certain aspects of religion. Boy Scouts look antiquated. High school was one of the last things to to hold up as as a reflection of shared American values of a shared you know everybody went to high school everybody knows what high school is like and so high school was the comprehensive high school which was designed I don't know more than a hundred years ago to prepare every, as a democratic institution to to prepare everybody more or less equally for life in America it, high school was designed to be an abridged version of adult life with all aspects of adult life, but kind of, you know, scaled down. And as such, I think it's, it's a great institution. And everybody's kind of miserable in high school. Even the people you think shouldn't be miserable are often really miserable. But the nice thing about high school in being a scaled down version of grown up life is the clarity of high school. Everybody, miserable or not, understands their place in the high school pecking order and understands why they're miserable. So I like high school as a place of clarity, as opposed to adult life, which is more, you know, nebulous. There was a show, The Last Man on Earth, premiered last night, and it's about, you know, literally the last guy who's left alive on Earth. And he doesn't know what to do. He's kind of drifting because there is no structure around him because everybody else is dead. And I think for a lot of people, adult life feels confusing and structureless because uh, because there aren't that many institutions left through which to define yourself. So, yeah, I like high school for definition okay, and that's, clarity. That's an interesting answer. Stripper, bartender, bouncer, nude model. What? Not bartender, just bouncer. Oh, just bouncer. Okay. So that's pretty rough. Are you a big guy? You don't look a big guy. How no, no. Right now I'm teeny. I'm like 148 pounds. Oh, we're going to talk about And that. even at my <laughs> biggest, I was, you know, generally in the mid 170s but yeah, i lift weights all the time so i'm pretty strong but also you know i'm not the guy who would throw you in a in a headlock and toss you out i'm the guy who checked your id and sent you away if it turned out to be a fake id okay just sent you away so what's the most important thing that you learned from all these jobs that prepared you for your later career as a television writer i mean are you a better writer having posed nude i uh, the, maybe i mean the the biggest thing I learned was to uh, give up pride, that never be afraid to, to embarrass yourself or grovel. You know, being a, a comedy writer is, for me at least, it meant exposing all my most, you know, humiliating aspects. If I couldn't get a laugh with my jokes, I could at least tell a super embarrassing story about myself and get a laugh. <laughs> okay. Back to this being the second smartest man in the world. Okay. Do most people bore you? Do I bore you? <laughs> No, I mean a lack of no. I mean a lack of input means I fall asleep. At least I, I started drinking coffee about two and a half years ago. Before then, I would fall asleep a lot, 
And especially if there wasn't enough stuff going on. You know, like, like at the gym, I, I need to take a book with me or a magazine or something to work on in between sets because I, I get really crazy if if there's not enough, you know, to, to think about, I guess. Right. You need to be simulated. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's fair. You became a contestant on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, and then you wound up suing the producers. I love this story. You're such yeah. a pistol. Yeah. I, give me an abbreviated version of that. All right. The deal is that Millionaire is one of the few quiz shows where they give you the correct answer. It's one of four possible answers, and you have. it's like the SAT. You have to pick the correct answer out of the four possibilities. They gave me a question, and I wasn't the only one to have this happen, where the correct answer wasn't there. And I didn't pick what they thought was the correct answer, and, and I you know, got kicked off. That, that, my, I, that was the end for me. Uh, you know, that, when you get a question wrong on that show, you're done. Now, I didn't necessarily know the correct answer, but in every other – I shouldn't have – if they can't, with all their resources and unlimited time and fact checkers and everything, if they can't come up with the correct answer, they shouldn't expect some guy in a chair, you know, with a phone call to, at most to be able to come up with the correct answer. And in every other instance where they asked a question where they accidentally left out the correct answer, they rectified it. They made it, they brought the contestant back. In my case, they claimed there was the way that I understood the question was not the way the question needed to be understood, and they were being disingenuous. They were asking for the highest capital city in the world, which is La Paz, Bolivia, and wasn't among the answers. They claimed they were really asking for, oh, which of these cities, the four cities we're giving you here is the highest, which is ridiculous, because... It's a tough enough question if you're if you're asking somebody to know what the world's highest is, but then to ask them which of four arbitrary cities is the highest is is much much more difficult. And they didn't ask which of these; they asked what is the high, you know world's highest, and they didn't have the world's highest in it. But they didn't own up to their mistake. And so I've, I've written for quiz shows, and I looked at 110,000 Who Wants to Be a Millionaire questions from around the world because that. That's a show that's spread to dozens and dozens of countries, and it's ridiculously consistent. When you want the top thing among all things, you ask what is instead of which of these is, and they were very consistent. It was obvious this was a mistake, but they tap danced away from it, so I sued them and lost. Nobody's ever won suing a quiz show. Uh, which I find absolutely fascinating. That I'm sure there are a lot of lawsuits against quiz shows, and I can't believe well, and I, I mean, I, mean, I do they're, believe they're, but. There are various degrees of disgruntled, of legitimacy of disgruntledness. The good thing in about the 50s. Right. I'm sorry. What's that? No, it's, uh, go ahead. I was, I was interrupting you. The, I was interrupting yeah, you. In the 50s <laughs> with the game, with the quiz show scandals, uh, there were several lawsuits of various degrees of legitimacy, most of which weren't so legit. Some one or two people sued because they'd been on 21 or one of the other shows that had been tainted by scandal and they felt that their reputation had been tainted because because of being associated with the show, which is ridiculous. So, you know, a lot of, of goofy, you know, several goofy quiz show lawsuits kind of tainted mine. Plus, judges are, are predisposed to think that, you know, you go on a, a quiz show, you get what you get. You know, you, you wanted, you're trying to get rich off of going on TV, and that's, you know, you take your chances. So the good news is it didn't work out for you there, but you went on a letter-writing campaign as a result of that because you were indignant about it. And that led to something that was pretty fantastic, which is a, a Academy Award-winning director, Errol Morris, saw you and started filming you. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was that was awesome. <laughs> I like the word. It was awesome. That's a yeah, trick. Because, I mean, he, I mean he's, he's a guy who he finds people who have obsessions, and then he helps them make sense of their lives well, through uh, interviewing them. Right. So... You know he's he's the greatest interviewer in the world, and yeah, that so that was he's and he's got the greatest piece of interviewing technology in the world. It's called an interatron. I love that thing. And yeah. it's it's a bunch of cameras duct taped together, so it looks like a Gatling gun with a bunch of lenses pointed at you. Except you never see it because in front of the 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 wad of cameras is a piece of glass that bounces his face off the glass in, into your face. You're looking right at him, but behind the his reflection on glass. So it's like you're talking to him 
face to face, but behind the glass is this Gatling gun of cameras. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. I have to go back. I haven't listened to that interview. Is that available online? I assume it is. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah it's on yeah. YouTube. I got to go find that. So from stripper to millionaire to Errol Morris to Jimmy Kimmel Live. <laughs> Easy transition. I love your life. You're like, um, God, what was that character uh, who, who who appears everywhere all the time? <laughs> you know, Zellig? Somebody, yeah. Woody Allen? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, somebody ought to write a novel about you. Just write a novel. Well, I, 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 I've got a memoir that's with publishers. Right, I know. And somebody needs to buy the memoir. I know, but I don't, that's your writing of it. I'd like to see somebody take it from the outside in and <laughs> write your story. It would be a trip. It really would. So you ought to do that. You ought to get somebody to do that for you. Um, writing for uh, comedy, writing for television. Mm-hmm. Uh, I sense, in a sense, in a, you're an introvert to some degree, to a strong degree. I think. How is that? How, what happens with the writing of comedy that that lets you? Because that's what happens. Well, no, I, I I started off as an introvert, but I through practice by by being a doorman in bars, I I met three quarters of a million people. So I've learned how to I've learned basic social skills. But I think inna- innately you're an introvert. No. Uh, I don't know. I mean, like it, you, you practice being somebody long enough, and you become that person. So that's the um, character. Yeah, but like, I mean, I can't stay off the Twitter now. <laughs> I'm pretty annoying, and that's that's a that's a fairly extroverted kind of thing. Except that there's a wall between you, you and the people that you're talking to. Say again. Sorry. There's a wall. There's a wall between the people yeah. you're talking to, which is protective, which is why these yeah. I mean, yeah, social I mean, media is so wonderful. I'm pretty terrible at parties. If I last an hour at a party, you know, that, that's a long time. So how does that translate into writing comedy? Um, well, you, you can't – you have to – I like collaborating with people. Okay. You get a better product, I think. And so, you know, writing comedy – is you get to work with people and see you can come up with the best stuff or see how you can make other people's stuff better all day. You get to laugh at people all day and with people. Um, so it's pretty great. So writing, writing for a Jimmy Kimmel show, which is jokes, or you've written for the Emmys and the not the Oscars yet, which we could have used you on this past one, by the way. Um, you didn't write the last one, did you? Um, but, writing, but writing for Jimmy Kimmel, that is that... What is that? Is that you're writing jokes? What are you writing? Uh, it's it's mostly you're you know coming up with jokes and ideas. Okay, so it's an intellectual process. There's a guy whose IQ tests I've taken named Paul Coymans who has, has a concept called um, width of association or associative width, where when you're faced with a topic or a problem. It's how many different things, analogies you can come up with to help you attack that problem. So solving a tough problem, I think, is similar to coming up with a joke. How many different unexpected angles can you come up with, you know, on a subject? So it is. Is there a way to, you know, to drop in a Kardashian on on a topic, or you know, and so there is it's it's an equation of sorts. Yeah. Where George Saunders, the writer, I agree with him when he says that the the humor is when you receive information faster than expected. I think it's humans live in the world on the ba- on our we survive through ferreting out information, looking for regularities in the environment that we can u- exploit to survive. Right, and that's usually you know a, a pricey process. You know, somebody eats the uh, the 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 berries and they keel over. Well, that person paid a price, but somebody might laugh at the person who keels over because somebody else paid the price. He got that knowledge at a reduced cost, at, at the loss of his friend, but hey, he's not the one who ate the berries, so yeah, it's kind of funny. So I think that you know, a joke is setting up a complicated scenario and then resolving it with a quick punchline, and the quickness of the punchline makes people laugh because it takes a complicated setup that's occupying a lot of real estate in your brain and resolves it down to a little kernel, and you're like, all right, I got it, explode the scenario with the punchline. So I said in the intro that you have produced 2,500 hours of broadcast television, earning seven Writers Guild Awards and Emmy nominations, correct? Well, I've worked on about 2,500 hours. You know, it was me and a zillion other people, and I, di- and I didn't get any of those nominations by myself. I was part of a team of a dozen or more writers. But what do you want to say to your high school friends in Boulder? 
I, <laughs> I think it's great. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain level of, hey, look, I, I live in L.A., and I get, I get to, you know, meet famous people every once in a while, and it's like, and, you know, it's, it's, it's that cliche of, if didn't go to prom with me, don't you feel stupid now? <laughs> I um, think it's a good thing. But yeah. it, it, I'm a little, I'm going to be 55 in two months. And, you know, I, I, it's my friends from high school and I were all kind of too old for that. Nobody looks like they did in high school anymore. So it, it, it's kind of a hollow victory. Uh, I don't know. I think it's a pretty gosh darn good victory myself. And I think you look damn good. Uh, it may be because you take <laughs> amazing amounts of supplements and you have a fitness routine that won't quit. I mean, What's the deal? I, I take about 70 pills a day, which encompasses, I don't know, 40 or 45 different ingredients or supplements. Um, Feeling good, huh? You know, I want to I, I be around for as much. The future is going to be, there's going to be a lot of really cool stuff in the future. Okay. Um, and well, I want to be around for it. So that's why you're doing it? As much as I can. Is this also to boost your intellect or your it's, libido? Well, I'm hoping. I take a <laughs> bunch of brain boosty stuff that claims to be brain boosters, but it's not really to, to boost my brain as much as to avoid, if I can, you know, age-related loss of mental ability. Okay. Also for your libido, you take anything for that? Uh, the, I take Avidart, which is for my prostate, and it's this, <laughs> it helps keep your hair. Um, he has a ton of hair as all guys. This, all these are plugs. The whole front of my head is, is 1,650 uh, hair plugs. Is it? I don't believe you. Is yeah. it? Really? Yeah, and but the avid the same stuff that makes your prostate blow up makes your hair fall out. So I take this avid art, which does not help your libido. Okay. It, in some people, it it you know it does the opposite. So no, I don't take any libido stuff, and I may be taking I don't know. It's it's it's. You take a balance of things for a balance of reasons. What would you tell me to take if you were going to tell me to take one thing for the the drug I love the best is metformin, which is a diabetes drug. I don't have diabetes. And that <laughs> makes, you know, I, I, everybody should take it even if they don't have diabetes. Really? Why is it, that? It, it helps your body use insulin more efficiently and avoid blood sugar spikes. And I read, and, you know, my research isn't the ultimately greatest, you know, research in the world, but I read there are two drugs that mimic the effect of calorie restriction Dang it. I like that word. It's, it's really stupid to have a landline anymore. <laughs> well, wait a second. Or you turn it off when you're going to do an interview. <laughs> oh, yeah. There is that. Sorry. <laughs> you see, like... And the phone always rings more when you're interviewing. I Believe me, I know. <laughs> It's always as soon as that record button's hit. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's the phone ring. It's fine. It's fine. It happens okay. all the time. No, don't worry about it. Go ahead. All right. So so metformin. There are two drugs that that mimic the effect of calorie restriction. When you restrict food and animals, they tend to live longer. The jury's out on people. But you don't really want to restrict calories in yourself because it's miserable. You want to you know you want to food is great. Right. You don't want to really limit yourself. So there are a couple drugs. One is resveratrol that tricks your body into thinking that you've restricted calories. And the other seems to be metformin. And resveratrol isn't entirely effective because it gets knocked out by your liver unless you inject it. And I'm not going to inject stuff. So, but metformin doesn't get knocked out, so it does the same thing. And having diabetes is kind of like being in a slow cooker. The more sugar in your system, the more you kind of get crispy. Oh, like, I believe you know, that. Like yeah. turkey skin. Yeah, absolutely. So, you, so you, you take both or just one or the other? Is that your record? I take a little resveratrol, but it, I, I love the metformin because I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. The only proof I'll have is if I'm still alive 40 years from now. <laughs> um, but I think it's really helpful. Other helpful stuff that's easy, half an aspirin a day for inflammation and blood thinning. You know, the omegas, which... You know, the jury was in on them, and now it's back out again. But those are pretty simple to take and seem to be helpful. Vitamin D, everybody's going crazy for right now. Right, right. Um, talk to me about this. Talk to me about this uh, theory of the universe that you have. I started when I was when I was ten. I, I decided I wanted to figure out the universe, and then when I was twenty-one, I had what I thought was a basic insight into how the universe might be arranged. And I've been thinking about it for the past, you know, almost 34 years. 
And I think I've made progress. I think, and a lot of people think, that the universe is a, is a gigantic information processor, you know, kind of like a brain or a computer. And I've concluded that that's inconsistent with a Big Bang universe. Hmm. That the Big Bang, that, that, that the universe being a Big Bang universe is like the universe being a calculator that only does one calculation and then you throw it away which is not what you do with a calculator. I think the universe explodes a little bit at a time over a vast period of time, much longer than the 14 or so billion years that the Big Bang says the universe is in age. I think it's, you know, quadrillions, quintillions, octillions, I don't know, some crazy number of, you know, 10 with a dozens of zeros after it, years old, because I think every iteration of the universe, rolling iteration, like I think the universe is like a boiling pot, where some of it's always, galaxies can be recycled. A galaxy starts off proton heavy, those protons coalesce into stars, which as they shine, emit energy and get turned into neutrons, and when, when you know, a galaxy is pretty much all neutrons, it's all collapsed, and I think it gets pushed to the side but I think you can relight it. I think you can hose it down with neutrinos, turn a bunch of those neutrons back into protons, and relight that galaxy. So the same way, you know, in boiling water, you know, bubbles come up, they release some water vapor, the, the, most of the water, you know, falls back down into the pot, and it just keeps kind of rolling. So, so where does that get us? I think the, the Big Bang doesn't really explain anything in terms of, you know, what the, the function of the universe or... In fact, it seems like a weird question to even ask that, in that metaphysics and physics kind of peeled away from each other a few centuries ago. Science started kicking metaphysics ass. The scientific and industrial revolution, you know, has transformed the world. It's delivered cons great results over centuries now. And metaphysics hasn't done any of that. It hasn't been able to conclusively answer any questions. So people just kind of gave up on asking metaphysical questions because it just it wasn't very productive to the point where now we don't it seems kind of weird to even ask well what's the universe for it's like that seems like kind of a spiritual kind of right. la di da you know question where the universe just is it, it, it there was this thing it blew up it, it you know it, it went through inflation galaxies coalesced and asking why that happened is a little weird, you know, from a scientific perspective. You know, you can w ask, well, why it happened? Well, yeah, there was an unstable vacuum that was packed with energy that, that fell over, you know, the pencil that was precisely balanced fell over and released all this energy. But to ask what, you know, what the why is behind the why seems unscientific. But we didn't have a good picture of the structure of the universe until less than a century ago, until we had general relativity and until Hubble's work, along with his associates, you know, gave us the picture of the Big Bang universe, which didn't start forming until about the 1920s. And the Big Bang wasn't definitively the, the universe of choice until about 1964. So but, can I take this out a, a different direction for a second? I want to ask you this. Yeah, Comedy yeah. writing and physics, where's the parallel universe? You're fascinating. I, I, I mean, I, I fell into to comedy writing. I did... After I graduated for high school, from high school for the last time, I was looking for a job as a nude model, and then I saw at colleges, and I saw a flyer, and MTV was looking for people to come play it, try out a game show they were developing, and then from that I just kind of fell into to writing. Um, but all the while I was, I was thinking about physics. Unbelievable mind. Unbelievable. I want to ask you a qu a concerning that mind. Where are you on the on the concept of intuition versus straight thought, uh, derived thought, I think is a good way to put that. I, I think we, I think we run on both. On balance, as, where as are I, you? As I said earlier, that consciousness is kind of raggedy. Uh -huh. But as as evolved creatures, we weren't everything. Everything in evolution kind of works as well as it needs to, and not a lot better. So we need to think well enough to, you know, to create the next generation of people. And consciousness needs to present itself to us, to each person, as consciousness makes our lives seem sufficiently interesting that we pay attention to ourselves and don't make errors and get killed. You know, it, consciousness kind of turns everybody's inner experience into a Michael Bay movie, really kind of big and dramatic. So we pay attention and don't walk into traffic. But 
it consciousness isn't as nearly as complete as we think it is. There's all the stuff that's running that we're not aware of. So yeah, intuition is a big deal because it's it's partly getting the results of unconscious processes in our, that are going on in our minds because our conscious minds are not that as complete as we think they are. So let's get back to girls. Okay. You, you have a wife and a yeah, daughter. we've been married almost twenty four years. And is she smart? Yeah, she's smart. And you she was my point. legal guardian for I my know. last. She was my fake legal guardian for my last semester in in fake high school. I love that. <laughs> Only you. And you have a daughter. So first, yeah, are they as it, smart as you? Listen to me. Let, let me hear me out on this. Are they as smart as you? And second, your wife, who you just said was your legal guardian, how's the kissing going? And third, do you wish that your daughter would be intelligent or dumb? And you know, an interviewer should never ask somebody a question that has really more than one question, but I figure you're okay. smart and well, you can handle it, my, so my, <laughs> talk to me. My wife's smart, my kid is really smart, and everybody other than me in the, in the little family is, is pretty normal, which seems to work out for them. And you know, then, Would you prefer your daughter be smart or not too smart? You know, because a lot of no, people I'm say hard. women who are smart have a really hard time in life. You've heard that. No, no, she's, 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 I, I mean, knock on wood, I think she, she does paneling. <laughs> I, I think she does pretty well in Navigating. Life, mm-hmm. And I, I wouldn't wish her any lessened abilities. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd wish, I'd wish that she was taller because she wants to be taller. Mm-hmm. Um, she kind of inherited my mom's not tallness. <laughs> Um, we instead all. of my wife's tallness, because you know my wife's about five inches taller than my kid, uh-huh. um, and and my daughter likes you know she's she's a costumer and she likes fashion and design and you know she she wants to be she'd like to be taller to to you know to have you know more of a you know a, a supermodel's height, but she didn't get that. But brains, no, I want her to have all the brains that she has. And I assume the kissing is now good. <laughs> <laughs> the kissing is fine. I mean, we've been married for 24 years. So. Yeah, and, and you did all right. So one other thing I want to ask you, and that is there's a fine line between smart and crazy. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, as, as I've said, like consciousness is is really raggedy and threadbare. And if you're going to having any kind of unusual abilities, it's going to put some strain on the system and make it, you know, easier to go, you know, off the rails. I'm, 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 I'm pretty OCD ish. Nah, <laughs> that was what I was looking for. when I was struggling over what you call yourself. That was it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I looked at 110,000 millionaire questions while suing them. You know, I, I, do, uh, I go to the gym five times a day. Do you still? I went to high school a gazillion times. So yeah, all that is, is you know, that pretty, or Yeah, that or you're a perfectionist. They're tied together. Okay, they're tied together. Okay, future. What's the story with the future? All right, I've got this memoir, Dumbass Genius, about, you know, the 10 stupidest years of my life when I went, kept going back to high school again and again and again. Student by day, stripper, bouncer by night, you know. I was basically the, 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 the smartest teenager in, in history because you take somebody who's in his mid-20s and you and make him 17, that, that blows, that adds an extra, I don't know, 150 IQ points because it's based on, you know, mental age over chronological age. So, and I gave myself an extra 10 years. So, and, I, and for all this smarts, I was doing ridiculous stuff, delivering stripping telegrams, you know, sitting in, in math class, kicking people out of bars. It was it was a really stupid ten years. Somebody should buy the book. It's it's and it's got the theory of the universe in it. Right. As kind of a Trojan horse. So why what more could you want out of a book? I, I can think of nothing. Absolutely nothing. Leave us with something smart. Um, it was part of the answer to one of your previous questions. One of the things I learned working in bars, one of the rules of, of meeting people in bars is never go home with somebody whose problems are worse than yours. But my variation on the rule is don't get with somebody who's crazier than you are. And I'm crazy enough for my whole family, and it's nice to have a, a normal wife and daughter. I've been speaking with Rick Rosner, owner of the world's second highest IQ, TV writer, and author of the upcoming book, Dumbass Genius. For more information on Rick, visit him on Twitter, where his handle is Dumbass Genius.
on Facebook at Rick G. Rosner, and be sure to visit his website at rickrosner.blogspot.com. Before I go, I want to remind everyone that podcasts of current and past shows are always available to listen to free on iTunes under The Hallie Casser Jane Show. The Hallie Casser Jane Show was also available for download via Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, BlogTalkRadio.com, and a host of other venues. Google The Hallie Casser Jane Show, and you will find us. Of course, podcasts of our shows, both past and present, are always posted for your listening pleasure at HallieCasserJane.com which I hope you'll visit often for the latest information on our upcoming segments. Oh, and while you're at HallieCasserJane.com, don't forget to visit my blog to read my latest musings. I'll be back next week, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for another edition of the Hallie Casser Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash the Hallie Casser Jane Show. Audible.com features over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Stay in touch, won't you? Remember, that's HallieCasserJane.com. Discover us on Facebook at Hallie Kesser Jane and on Twitter at Hallie CJ. I love to hear from you. So, till we meet again, this is Hallie Kesser Jane. It's a wrap.